Hey folks, with us today, Randy, CEO of Mexio. Super happy to have you on. Oh, it's my pleasure. Awesome. So it's the first time we have a professional CEO on the podcast. <laughs> so I would love to start with exactly that. How did you end up being a professional CEO as a career? Yeah, well, Nicholas, I, I, I say it's because I wasn't smart enough to be a founder. Um, and I, you know, there's some truth to that. Like I, I did never, never had in my life a, a problem that I felt was so acute that I had to go solve it and found a company to do it. Uh, instead I came up, I was in the military for a while and I went and I was with big companies, uh, Microsoft and Salesforce and a couple of small companies, but always in the, an operator role. Um, I ended up being promoted to, uh, CEO, my first time CEO, when I was CRO of a company, a public company. And that um, they gave me the opportunity. And so that's what started me on that track. And so having run a public company, we had about, I don't know, 13, 1400 people around the world and learning how to do that. I, I like that. I like that scale and that size and working on that set of problems. So um, what I decided going forward was if I had the opportunity, I'd look for companies that were in their expansion growth phase. So they already have a product, they already have product market fit. They already um, have a, a, replicable, a replicable sales model and what they need is help scaling. So I call it professional CEO. You could talk, call it the distinction between a startup CEO and a scale up CEO. And so I, I like the challenges of that scale up. How do you get a bunch of people um, coordinated, aligned and to really go to that next level of um, growth in a company? And now that it's not your first rodeo anymore, is there what was the biggest learning meaning if you if you look back what did you do at the first time you were a ceo compared to now where you're like damn i do it so differently nowadays why didn't i know that the first time around well i think one of the things if things are going well they don't need someone like me right and i hope that most of the people that are listening to your podcast are founders ceos are going to have extraordinary growth and personal and, and professional, um, and they will have a supportive board and they'll continue on and go public and have a, a very incredible career. What happens is you find that most, or my experience is many founder CEOs of tech companies are, are technologists and they really like the product. And so at some point, the, the company, the operations become something they don't want to deal with. They'd like to go back to product. So then that's when they need to hire someone like me, a go to market. Uh, that's going to help them figure out how do you drive that business. So I think the first thing you learn going into a situation is what's not working because the board is looking outside uh, and, and thinks it's not working. We're not getting the numbers or whatever. They're not happy with X, Y, and Z. You go inside and start the conversations and do the interviews and everyone kind of, it's like the blind men around the elephant, right? They're touching the, tr the trunk and the leg, but they don't have the full picture. And so the first 90 days is always about trying to go in and figure out what's going on, what's working, what's not, what are the bets you need to make? And I think I'm Nicholas doing it now a third time, I guess I just have more, um, prop two things. One is I, I can see the pattern better, right? The first time you do it, you don't know what's going on. Just everything seemed broken. And so you see the pattern. And then I think I get more quickly to conviction around where we need to fix things first. And I think that is one of the things you want from a, a professional CEO is to be able to diagnose the situation, come up with a recommendation and have conviction around it. When you do it at the first time, you don't know. I mean, what I write about on my LinkedIn profile is you don't know how to be a CEO to your CEO. It's just, it's, it's just a very different job. And it's you're at the nexus of all information. I think maybe that's another thing is how do you, how do you consume an enormous amount of information and start parsing it? In, in, in determining what's relevant for you to act on now, because you can just get crushed by how much information there is. And there's no job you have before that. Maybe if you're a CFO, before becoming a CEO, perhaps you're at that same kind of center nexus of information and nexus of um, expectation. So the expectation of the board, the expectation of the executive team, the expectation of all the employees. And you just, you're never like, you know, everyone else can quit and blame it on the CEO. The CEO yep. can't quit <laughs> and blame it on the CEO. So <laughs> there's something about that. If you need to hire the right developers and ship fast, 
then React Squad is for you. A boutique agency that specializes in React and only works with fast growth startups. Get a 14-day risk-free trial and a transparent price of $95 per hour. Visit reactsquad.io to learn more. God, I, w- I would love to double click on one thing you said, meaning that the founders are often more product oriented and this can be in conflict with the CEO role at like a scaling phase. At what point, if you're a founder and you're growing and everything's going quite well or at least okay, what are signs that you should think of bringing in the CEO if you don't have a board that is maybe not forcing you, bugger, but pushing the, the conversation? Yeah, I, I think it's, um, you just have to be really honest with yourself about what are the set of problems that you want to focus on. So for example, if you're having a lot of success, you may not need to bring on a professional CEO. You may need to bring on a, um, what would be helpful is bring on a COO. So Google did this, Facebook did this. Like you see these large companies where the founders are still in place, but what their focus, the problem sets they want to work on are um, where are we going with our product vision? What are the technical challenges we want to overcome? They don't want to run the organization and like run a sales organization and be part of that whole dynamic. And they may have ideas about marketing, but they don't want to be in the minutia of driving marketing campaigns. So I think it's the, the advantage you have if you are operating from a place of strength, which is you're delivering on the expectations of value creation for the shareholders. So if you've taken VC and I'm, I'm primarily, uh, I, I haven't yep. done a bootstrap company. So my assumption is you've taken someone else's uh, money, you're playing with someone else's money and they have expectations for what needs to happen. As long as you're hitting those gates, then I think you get a chance to really think about what is it that you want to do. I think the hardest thing, Nicholas, that I found for especially technically oriented founders is letting go is they see everything as a problem that they can solve if they just think about it, right? Like every technical founder I know is like, oh, we'll just build that in their early stages of a company rather than, oh, no, no, this, this, tech, this vendor has a better capability. We don't need to build that. We can just use theirs. And then you can apply that same thinking to how you build an organization. Technical founders often think, oh, I'll just fix it, right? I just, I'm smart enough to figure the problem out versus saying, oh, I don't have to spend time and energy there. And at some stage you break because you can't focus on everything. And so I think it's when you feel like you're burned out, when you feel like you're not happy, when you feel like you just don't like managing people and dealing with people issues, like that's where you can find someone, which is what I would have done if I had not been CEO was I, I would be a COO. And so if I had gone into a company, a multiple time founder, super successful CEO, I'm like, well, I'll give you an example. So I went to, uh, I sold Percolate, which was about a $30 million company to a large sales enablement company called uh, Seismic. And the CEO there, Doug Winter, is extraordinary. I mean, just really, he's been in the role for 10 years. The company's on fire. And what was really interesting for me, Nicholas, was, so I've been CEO twice. I got to be chief strategy officer with Doug and watch him in action. And I was like, God, I just learned an enormous amount. And he's my age. I mean, maybe even, uh, yeah, I think we're the exact same age. And so I just have this really wonderful opportunity to not be CEO, but be able to help out on many fronts. And so I think for a founder CEO, like how do you bring in a chief strategy guy or gal? How do you bring in a COO? Or how do you hand things off to your CFO uh, if you bring that person on and create space to be where you are your best? Do you feel like it's about finding the place where you're both passionate about what you do because you mentioned burnout you mentioned not being happy and excellent or like how how, how how would you prioritize that meaning what if you're amazing at marketing but you kind of hate doing it like how yeah break I, it down I, for me a, a couple of things one is i have this great um someone told me it's like having an avocation that's your vocation meaning the thing you're really interested in is also your job and I don't, I think, I mean, maybe there are people who can be great at everything. Um, but I, I think having a, a humility to recognize where do you spike? What do you do really well? Where do you get, what do you get energy from? So even though you could do marketing, if it's not giving you energy, then it's enervating. And so I think the opportunity is like where, if you, if you woke up in the morning and you didn't have your calendar full, what would you choose to do and why? What is it about that project ask, problem set? Um, that you really care about. 
Uh, the other thing I would say, Nicholas, that I have found valuable uh, when I went for my first CEO gig, because I was freaked out with the imposter syndrome, like I think everybody is, is I asked for three things. I asked for a mentor. So someone who had done the role that I had done, which was a turnaround. And I had a great guy, Tony Zingali, that we paid for, who I could meet with on a regular basis and talk about where we were and our turnaround. And he had lots of great ideas and suggestions, right? So a mentor for a specific business context. Number two is I asked for a coach. And the coach was more of like the HR uh, type person that I wanted help understanding how to manage a board and the personalities and had a very, very senior board on a public company, as you can imagine, right? They weren't investors. These were public company board members. And so really interesting perspectives and learning how to be more effective with those. So that was number two. Number three is I asked for support to join a, a community of peers. And so the one I ended up doing was Alliance of CEOs. For lots of founders, there's EO, there's YPO. And so I think that what that does for you, uh, Nicholas, is it, it gives you an opportunity to talk to other people who are in the same spot you are. Um, it also starts to help you understand the different types of CEOs. You start to see how they model. And people are really, uh, if, you, if you haven't been to one of these things, they're really um, transparent and candid. And so it's really reassuring to know that you can talk through, well, I feel good about doing this. I don't feel good about doing this. Or you know, I don't get answered. What would you do? So I, I just started an, another program with Vistage which is another one of those peer group type programs and went to an all day meeting yesterday and it was super valuable. And again, it leads me to think about even in my role as CEO, where do I spend time? What am I avoiding? Like what's the problem I'm not taking on? And I think it's that growth that helps you with a mentor, a coach, and a, a group of peers that can help you as an early stage, first time founder CEO, move through those inflection points. You're not expected to know how to run a thousand person company. You've never run a thousand person company before. But if you put the scaffolding around and have the support of your board to grow, then it doesn't just have to be you with the whiteboard trying to figure it out. So it's basically the trifecta of the mentor, someone who's been there, done that, the coach, I guess like a subject matter expert, depending on what's most pressing for you, and then the peers. So just also to the not only on the intellectual side, but also for the emotional support in a way. Yeah. The only clarification is that, but I think of the mentor as the person who's helping you with the what. So you're trying to do a business transformation. The coach for me is help me with the how, emotional intelligence. So how do I manage the relationship? For me, the thing I wanted to solve was manage the relationship with the boards. It's better understand how they view the world, how I'm showing up, how that whole dynamic, because a lot of board management is your calling them, you're checking in, you're getting their temperature. They have all different perspectives. You're trying to align them. And so it's, it's very much to me, you got to deliver the results, but it's very much a uh, managing a group of people that don't report to you, but directly impact your life. And so how yeah. do you be more interpersonal effectiveness? Like how do you be more effective at managing the board? And I thought that um, at the end of the day, this, the, the board's job is to hire and fire the CEO. So how do you yep. make sure that you're working with them to understand what success looks like, that you're appealing to, you know, they're all, they're all people, they all, they all got their foibles. Like how do you appeal and solve that? How do you create harmony um, on the board? How do you create consensus? So that was what the coach was, is more about the, the how, not the what. I love that clarification of the mentor talking like, telling you about the, the what or talking about that and then the how, the tactical stuff. I, I would love to, to move more on topic, meaning on, on Mexio. It's the merger between Chartify and Says Optics. And at least if my data is right, you joined one month after the merger was done. Not how did, okay, how, 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 how did it take, take me through that. I, I would love yeah. to hear about the, the starting point of view of the company. Yeah, so uh, Battery Ventures, which is a large top tier VC primarily has a PE fund. They also have what they call a majority growth equity fund, where they look at uh, high growth SaaS companies and take majority interest. So Battery brought two companies together, Chartified SaaS Optics 2021. Both companies have been around for 12 years. We, we saw Chartified was basically complicated, complex pricing, um, uh, um, billing, uh, engine and SaaS optics is uh, revenue recognition and reporting and supporting more like sales led motion. So you have product led motion, sales led motion come together. 
They brought those together in 2021. Uh, they are the exact same size, which is really interesting. So it wasn't an acquisition. Often with an acquisition, you have the larger company like Seismic that bought Perkley. And as Perkley, you come in and you adopt all of the um, systems, tools, and process of the acquiring company. After a little while, I think the CEO probably made a bunch of money um, and decided it was time to go or didn't like working with PE firm or whatever. They, they started looking for a new CEO. And I think at my earlier point, part of the challenge they were having was the merger of equals meant they weren't getting things moving forward as quickly as they would like in terms of integrations because it was two different tribes arguing over which way it should be done. Um, so they brought me on board in 2022. So I've been here for just over a year. And um, it was for me, what was valuable, you didn't ask this, but I'll just say, so I had spent most of my career selling to go to market teams, marketing, sales, and service. And had been a CEO twice, and it's been okay. I mean, I don't have a helicopter, I don't have a yacht, but you know, it's it's been okay. What I felt like I wanted to do was take my CEO skills and apply it to a different context. So what Maxio allowed me personally to do was say, now I'm going to go learn how to sell to the CFO. I know SaaS, I know services. I, I mean, I know them pretty well. But now, if I can demonstrate I can be successful in a different end market, then I think that broadens my resume, my CV for the next stage, which is where I'd like to be an operating partner at a PE firm or, or sit on boards. But um, I didn't want to go back and do another marketing tech company. And so it's been really interesting. It's a different set of problems. It's a different way of selling. It's a different way of marketing. And so it feels like it's um, um, a lot similar, but different enough that it's interesting. What did it feel like to slowly get the itch of, I want to do something different? Because at least as a quote unquote young guy with 30, you, you're so thinking, okay, if, if I'm ahead of my career, I will know exactly what to do until I'm basically retired. So how, how did you for yourself like feel that or like, yeah, just like get, get to the realization that you, you want to have a shift? Interesting. So I'll back up a little bit. I think um, when I talk about people, some people don't have this am ambition, but they're just not driven to be CEO. That's totally fine. I went to the Naval Academy. When I went to the Naval Academy, I thought I wanted to be an admiral. So, you know, I'd always wanted to be a, the captain of the ship. I went to business school. Uh, when the business school I went to, it was all about, you're going to go be a CEO. And so I, I've always had this in my, uh, on my dream to be a CEO. I didn't know I would be a multiple kind of CEO. Um, so then I think it becomes around what's the context you want. So I've been a public company CEO. I've been a private company CEO, but VC backed. I thought that what I'd like to do is be that operating partner guy at some point. So then it was, well, what would make me better qualified to be a, a partner, uh, an operating partner type? And that's where it felt like uh, well, two things need to be true. One is if you have a broad set of experiences. So if you want to be an operating partner at a high growth company, you need to have been a successful CEO of high growth companies. Um, and then number two is what I found operating partners at PE firms usually had to have made money for that PE firm. Does that make sense? It's hard to go to Francisco or Vista and say, hey, hire me as an operating partner if you haven't been a CEO of their company. So having been part of battery, you know, ideally there'd be an opportunity at the end of the, the day to maybe shift to another battery portfolio company or continue on with battery as a operating partner. Um, so that was, that was the thinking was it was, I know I wanted to do another gig. I wanted it to be a different. I knew which stage I wanted. I, I you know, I very clear. I wasn't going to go for anything that was less than 40 mil. Talk about that. And I knew that what I was trying to do was uh, build out a, a broader set of experiences for the next stage. Sounds like it's also always a bit of seeking a new challenge or yeah, am I totally. inter interpreting too much into that? No, I think that's right. I think um, I always talk to people about when they're making their career shift is set up uh, a list of their job satisfaction criteria and have it be forced ranked. So everyone will say, hey, you know, I want a manager. I want to be paid well. I want blah, blah, blah. But like it, it, you literally like the number one thing you're going to solve for. And it can change at different times. So for example, in my career, at different times, I've said the most important thing for me is to have a really strong manager, or I really want to work in an organization where there's an incredible leader. 
as I've been in situations where I haven't liked the leader and it's just, you know, hit me, impacted me. And, but for me, the number one thing that's been consistent throughout my career is I want it to be intellectually um, stimulating. I want it to be interesting. That's the number one thing I'll solve for. And so I get, I get bored easily. I, I don't want to do the same thing again and again. So yeah, there is this, this uh, desire to go work on a different set of problems. I totally understand that desire for novelty. And then one maybe quick tip questions for the listener. For someone who's maybe running a smaller company, let's say 25 to 100 people, what do you think are like the three most important areas or skills, maybe more of a how question than a what question, that founder CEOs are lacking? I, I would, I would suggest I haven't spent a bunch of time with companies that size, but my sense is that at that size, the founder CEO has personal relationships with everybody on the team and it's a family and they're all mission oriented. You know, they're not making a lot of money, but it's all on the upside and they're going to go conquer the hill. I think the thing that, um, a founder CEO, the transition needs to be from family to team. Still important to have great team members, but you are going to have to start cycling on them. And the person that got you to a million is not going to be the person that got you 10 million. They're not going to be the person that gets you from 10 to 20. And so if you've taken, if you've taken VC money, being able to talk about your team dispassionately with the VCs about what are you going to do and how are you going to evolve it over time? Because the VCs are always going to push you. They're going to push you to say, okay, when are you going to replace, when are you going to hire your first salesperson? Um, right. When are you going to hire your first CRO? When are you going to hire your VP of finance? Are you going to hire a VP of finance versus CFO? And the person that was your bookkeeper, can they be the VP of finance? The, if it's part of your family, you're like, yes, absolutely. If you're the coach of the team, it's a little bit different relationship. And I think that's, that's number one. Um, I think number two is what we were talking about a little bit earlier is at that stage, you feel like you should, you can know everything because you can, you do one ones all the time and you're making decisions. And so how do you parse things out and say, oh, what I need to do is focus on the most important things. I don't need to solve everything. Um, I remember when I was at Microsoft, I would I'd taken over a division. It was about 250 people. It was the largest division that I'd run at the time. And I was still operating under the role, under the assumption that I could know about everything that was going on across all the other sub functions of the division. And it was worldwide and, you know, I was up, never sleeping and I just broke. Like I just couldn't keep up with it. And my marriage was suffering. My kids hated me, you know, like I just totally collapsed. And I think it's almost like you want every founder to have one of those. that's not terminal, meaning they don't die from it, but they have a moment where they break. Because then the break is, I can't do it by myself. I need to work with other people. And so I think if a founder CEO of a very early stage company recognizes they're going to need help, go get a mentor. Go, if they're that group size, go become part of EO, right? And go be part of YPO. Like create space and time for you to develop the skills for you to be ready for the next stage. That makes a ton of sense. And then at what stage do you feel like, I mean, it's likely a bad question on the companies you're currently operating, but maybe in your, in your career so far, at what point do you feel like the, this breaking point hits, meaning the breaking point in terms of not being able to know everything? Yeah. Um, well, for me, it was the 250 people. So I, it may be different. And, and now I have 200. 50 people and I don't know everything, but I've set up a structure with executives, et cetera. So I, maybe it's 50, maybe it's a hundred. Um, yeah. I, th I think it's part of, uh, I usually think the, if you've gotten to $10 million in revenue, you are now about to enter the valley of death. And what I mean by that is it's, it's not easy to get 10 million. I'm not saying it is. There are a lot of companies who get to 10 million. There are very few companies that go from 10 million to 50 million. And so if you're coming up on that $10 million threshold, if you haven't built the organization to support the growth to 50, then you're already behind. And so I, I would say that's probably, there's a, there's a million dollar inflection point, a $10 million inflection point, 
I think there's an inflection point at 50 and an inflection point at 100. I used to talk about this in the military terms is like, if you think about, you think about a company that's 25, that's like a company, right? In, a, in, a, in an army, right? That's a company, it's a couple of platoons, it's bigger than, you know, four guys in a pizza. Um, and you need to be thinking like a captain. When you come up to that next stage and now you're running a brigade, you need to be thinking like a major. And if you're running in a division, you're thinking like a general. And so I think if you think about these, these and these, like, we talked a bunch of people about it, there are these absolute inflection points in terms of revenue is a reflection of um, a proxy for complexity. And so are you mentally ready? Are you, do you have the people behind you? Or do you have the systems and technology to support that next inflection point? So if you're stuck on any of those, then I guess the answers, of course, differ on how to go to the next one. But just noticing that you are hitting that inflection point, I guess, is a, a big, important realization to make. And, and then I think the, uh, I keep hammering this, but talk to people that are in your same frame, stage, stage appropriate, right? Like, so at this meeting yesterday, I was at Vistage and I was talking to these guys and I had this one issue I was worried about and wrestling with. And they said, well, how many... How many PE CEO friends do you have? I said, like, gosh, I don't know. Like, I don't, I don't have specific friends that are CEO of PE companies. I was like, oh, that's a great piece of advice. Go find four of those people, you know, and have a casual Friday conversation once a month and what's working for them and what's working for us. Like, there's so many things that are unique to a PE type context that I, that I wanted to learn, um, but I don't have... Uh, I, 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 I'm not taking my own advice in terms of creating my own advisory board, which is, so I was like, a great idea. So I need to go figure that out. Amazing. And then as we were running up on time, I have two final questions. The first, what's the vision you're currently driving for at Mexio? The vision? Yeah. Oh, so we, what I love about this company is every B2B SaaS company needs what we have. And we will help companies unlock their next stage of growth. So everything we were talking about, unlocking the next stage of growth for the individual, I think about the passion that we have is to help them unlock that next stage of growth in terms of running their business efficiently, effectively, getting funded, staying funded. Love it. And then the final one, for people who want to learn more, where can they find you online? Yeah, the easiest way is LinkedIn. I read a lot. I mean, I think this is where you all found me is the articles yep. I was writing about professional CEO. I've actually started to write a, a six part series on the secrets of success for a CEO. So I'd love for people on your podcast to read those articles, add comments, let me know what you think. And then of course, if you want to reach out, um, my email is randy.wooten. I assume you put it in the podcast. Yep. Um, we'll link everything up. Maxio.com. And I'm, I'll always make time. Always make time. I love learning from people and hearing what people are doing and sharing ideas and and i get better from that as well amazing randy thank you so much for coming on today my pleasure have a great day nicholas you too if you like this episode then you'll love the SaaS operator a weekly newsletter brought to you by early node with actionable insights from SaaS experts in the industry delivered right to your inbox every tuesday for free visit earlynode.com to subscribe